where would what in innovation terms we call the laggards fit in your four temperament models and um, how would you sort of engage with them to encourage more innovation? Um, the laggards, superficially you'd put in what would be the dependables because they're the ones that tend to be slower to change. Um, having said that, I've worked with lots of what we call laggards and been able to achieve change. It's the way you approach it and understanding their values and what's actually driving what they're looking for in their farm business and then being able to position whatever that technology or practices might be to get there. So they tended to be more on, if you can think of a slide on the left hand side, the people that tend to think, well, who like working in the business rather than on the business, tend to be more in that laggard sort of end. Um, but I, I always have trouble with the laggard sort of tag because I, I know some people that, you know, everybody said, oh, they're laggards, they won't do anything. They will do something, you've just got to be able to work with them. And I think understanding where they're coming from is that starting point and then tailoring it accordingly. And I think we've been really poor at that. We somehow are attracted to the people that want to grab a technology we put out there and run with it because it's easy, because they're taking it from us. The harder bit is to pick up the next level down. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Emma. Yes. Uh, Kate Burke from Think Agri. Uh, Cam, good talk once again. Um, following on from that question, Cam, uh, which temperament type um, tends to have the better likelihood of uh, getting a good return on investment? <laughs> oh. See, that's another one where um, all four of them can. And in fact, I've seen, and I work with a number of what I'd call the dependables, and they get really good return on investment because what they do is they're very careful about a dollar they spend, and it's already been raised today that you know, understanding your costs and driving your costs down tend to do that. They don't necessarily get the spectacular returns, but at the same time, they don't lose a lot of money. So they're a, they tend to be a, a very stable sort of group that get a reasonably consistent return on investment. Um, Sometimes the pioneers will pull off a big one, but I've had some pioneers that have gone down the gurgler in a really big way too, just because I've taken a punt. They're more, more likely to take a risk, more likely to have a crack at something. So I don't think, again, I don't think the personality, um, you, you can't categorise them with those personalities because I think all of them can do it right and all of them can not get the return. So what, what, what do you want to be? Dependable? <laughs> oh, I guess my question was really for, for the uh, investors in the room or, or people employing managers, um, which type of manager should they be employing if they're uh, wanting to get a, a robust and long-term return on investment? I think you answered the question. No, that was a good, good I'd question. say there isn't one. Uh, I can find some really good doers some really good doers. And I've got a few of those clients that I work with now. And if you're an investor and you wanted to invest in someone that was willing to have a crack and do a good job, that'd be fantastic. Okay, any more questions? Yes, I can see a hand up there at the back. Up the back and to the, to, under the lights there. Thank you. Thank you. It's Diane Lewis. I asked a question earlier this morning about family farms and farming families and their resilience or ability to stay. But now I'm in rural Victoria where there's been a closure of a lot of the um, institutions would allow the research that you're working with and talking about in meat and livestock or drugs and whatever, they've closed and the extension isn't there. So what is it that we have nowadays to enable the interface between the people on the farms and the knowledge that you're all talking about and the technologies that you're talking about? Where is that nexus now? OK, well, I'm going to ask one or the other of the panel to answer. Who, Richard, Christine? <laughs> um, so certainly uh, there has been a significant reduction in those resources. Um, at the same time, hopefully, there's been an increase in alternative mechanisms. So uh, whilst not all farmers have access to the internet, there's a lot more efficiencies that can be gained through an online uh, communication tool. And I think m most of the RDCs now have strategies in that place. 
which I know doesn't suit everyone, but it's, it certainly fills some of the gaps. And then I think the other area that we're working on, not by choice, but by, but by requirement, uh, because of those reduction in state-based resources, is the, is the private sector. So we, we in MLA certainly have a lot of programs now where we're facilitating and co-investing in the growing of a private sector community around extension by training new consultants um, and getting them placed into the industry so that they're there ready to provide that kind of service. Yeah, and I'd like to reiterate that as well. I think the RDCs uh, identify that because the states have uh, withdrawn a lot of those services, that there is a gap there and that the RDCs are focused on trying to build some sort of bridge in that area. And uh, we've been talking to government about uh, um, how we actually incentivise the commercial uh, you know, players in the, in the industry to actually take up some of those roles. It's an absolutely key question. Thank you very much for it. Now, is there a question down here? Thanks, Mark Ritchie from uh, Regional Development Australia, Riverina. To Rick, um, we have a fairly um, substantial forestry industry in the Tumut Tumbarumba area, and in time, it's going to run out of well, it's not going to run out of wood, but the plantation expansion um, to service the mills and the, the organisations like Visi um, is going to be problematic. Um, where do you see the next lot of in, of patient investors coming from to drive that? Um, expansion because there's a whole lot of innovation that could come from that um, in a whole lot of different products that we just don't have at the moment because there's not a supply, uh, longer term supply chain. Yeah, thanks for the question. So for those who don't know, the, Australia has one million hectares of softwood plantations. The last hectare was actually planted in 1990. This is for a resource that you need at least 30 years of rotation to get. So we've actually got this quite significant looming crisis about where is the wood and how to actually get the wood in the ground. And the challenge here, um, and uh, Ross, my colleague Ross Hampton from AFPA is in the audience, uh, Ross has set up a program of trying to identify regional hubs and, and those that are actually located to existing processing areas, of which Tumut, Tumbarumba is a key region. The challenge, I think, is critically for this type of audience, is how do we actually get the farm sector to see trees as part of their crops? Um, you look at, at the Tumut Tumba area, there is a lot of area very close into the mills that people have decided not to turn into trees. Now we actually, this is an extension question which goes back to the lady up there. Um, it's about trying to get the, the right business models, um, whether those are cooperative structures which we've failed dramatically in the sector to actually develop. Um, and uh, trying to actually exercise some of the money from superannuation or other types of investors. Um, the new category of investors in the sector, the timber investment management organisations, they haven't been very good at expanding the estate yet, but their hurdle rates are actually dropping and it's now talk that they may start to do some greenfield investments. Um, but there's, there's a whole challenge in this space, um, both from a public policy, from a financial and from an industry one, and we haven't quite cracked it. Okay, and Tim? Uh, Tim Lester from the Council of Rural R&D Corporations. Richard, I wanted to ask you about the international collaboration space. This is obviously something a lot of the R&D corporations are talking about and thinking about, and, um, and you've entered into some with GRDC. What I'm wondering is, is are we too narrow in our approach to that, or is there more that we should be doing to engage with the large multinational companies? Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for that. Um, Look, I, 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 narrow. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity. There's still, there's certainly opportunity to to expand that uh, that process. And that was uh, actually my closing comment was, you know, where we where we are leaders, we should really uh, take the opportunity and, and lead. I mean, I don't think it's in every space, but in certain specific areas where we truly uh, are, you know, leading in the world, uh, I, I would really encourage, you know, the RDCs and and and. Um, you know, they're supporting growers to, to take a global view because I, I, there's always a temptation, I think, to, yeah, you know, we're leading, let's say, in dry land agriculture. We can, you know, develop all the technology and use it for our advantage uh, going forward. I think it's a false thinking because if you really develop something reasonable and you try to keep it for yourself, um, you know, A, you're probably not going to develop it fully and B, you, you know, we're, we're such a small market, you're going to be copied. Uh, whatever machine you develop is going to be produced at much higher volume somewhere else, and, you, and, and they're going to, it's going to be much cheaper. So the Australian, you know, approach will be will be, you know, overtaken. 
Uh, much better, I think, to, to look, look for you know, global players that you can collaborate in. You may not dominate the space, but we can ensure our participation in the development of these global technologies um, uh, so that we can ensure you know, the correct uh, adaptation for Australian needs and we can ensure our, our participation in how it's developed around the world. Thanks, Richard. Any other questions? Yes. week ago and what worries me in our space I'm protected cropping um, is some of the stuff that we're seeing you you guys working on it takes such a long time for it actually to come to Australia get registered and once it is registered some of those formulations in the microbial space are not very stable for long distance travel you know how far ahead the road are you for establishing production here in Australia to keep us you know with uh, up, uh, with the rest of the world up front with them I mean, that, that challenge of microbial products, it, it's, it's a significant challenge, you know, the, the, the shelf life of those products. That, that we we um, bought that company um, in Sacramento uh, three years ago. Um, it was agri formerly AgriQuest. And one of their fundamental business options or f uh, principles was that they wanted to develop products that were shelf-stable shelf and could be you know, distributed through a normal uh, distribution system. You didn't have to have them in massive fridges and, and have very shel short shelf life. You have to return them and so on. So in principle, those products will be, you know, let us say, two years shelf stable. So that will allow global dis uh, distribution. Uh, most of them, I think, are manufactured either in Mexico or, or in America. Uh, at this point, we, we haven't considered local production. It's very, very specialised. Um, and we're going to rely on that, that, that long-term uh, storage, and I, yeah, I, hope it, I hope it works. Yep. And, and lead time for registration here? Um, they're coming. Actually, we're going to launch the first products uh, this, this year. So, um, and uh, they'll gradually roll out over the next uh, two, to, two to three years. Yep. Okay. Um, I have a question for Rick. Um, Rick, you were talking about uh, fashion as a type of innovation. Um, and I sort of got the feeling of seeing people walking around with wooden shirts and, 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 and jackets. But look, um, is it relevant to forest and wood products, sector? Well, rayon is actually a wood product. That's um, one. Um, but wood actually, for those who watch Grand Designs, is very much on trend at the moment. And that's actually my biggest fear, because architects are like most uh, uh, designers. They like to do things that are different. And you actually start to then move to other, other products. Um, one of the areas where we're trying to ensure that wood doesn't become just a trend is actually in the education and health area where there is actually research suggesting that it actually can improve educational and health outcomes. And it's trying to move it away from a fashion but turn it into something that actually has long-term benefits to the, to the occupants. Thanks for that. Okay, look, uh, in the um, essence of time, um, I'm going to close the session, but before I do so, I'd just like to say... Uh, Thank you to our speakers. Uh, I think they've done an excellent job. They're on time. Their information was absolutely excellent. And I'd like you to give them all a round of applause. <laughs>